23-year-old Molly McLaren couldn't possibly have imagined that the man she swiped right on on the dating app Tinder would brutally take her life. This was a man who literally couldn't let her go. And when she finally broke up with Joshua Stimson, he stalked her, he harassed her, and finally he murdered her in broad daylight. This is the stalking and murder of Molly McLaren. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Thanks for joining me. Obviously, whenever I cover a case, they are personal and clearly they impact and affect people out there who are related to these situations or have even lost members of their own family. Whenever I do videos, I'm always really mindful of that. It's one of the reasons why I also ask you for suggestions because often you will give me suggestions because of a personal connection. And today's case is being covered because of that. I was in Chatham, which is where Molly McLaren lost her life. Very sadly, I was presented by the Serial Killer Next Door show and some people waited behind the stage door at the end to actually just have that conversation about covering this case. So I wanted to do that because clearly people want this story out there. Molly McLaren was an incredibly well-loved human being, deservedly so. And also it's about heightening people's awareness of stalking. Because even today, in this day and age, I don't think it's taken as seriously as it should be. And I always fear that there are missed opportunities. And I think that this case highlights those missed opportunities. I've covered them before in videos. Today's case is no different. Absolutely, lessons need to be learned. Whether they will be learned, I'm not sure. But certainly, it concerns me that women die and of course at times men die but the statistic is far higher for women and what are we doing to change outcomes and how will those outcomes in the future ideally prevent cases that I'm going to cover today ever happening again. So let's talk about Molly McLaren. Well she was a pretty amazing woman, pretty amazing outstanding individual. She was 23 years of age, she was living in Cobham at the time of her murder she was a student at the University of Kent. She was actually in her second year studying for a degree in health and fitness. She was on, apparently, to get a first. She was incredibly bright. She was an A-grade student, but also she was very committed and very devoted to that particular area. Molly hadn't always had it easy. She'd actually struggled with eating disorder and mental health issues, so she suffered with bulimia, and also she was somebody who struggled with anxiety and did at times have anxiety attacks. And I do think that that probably motivated her to go into the health and fitness arena because essentially when you are dealing with something as crippling as anxiety or an eating disorder, it gives you direct insight into how it feels to be out of control and it gives you a level of empathy with those individuals who themselves struggle with things like nutrition. And so I think that her motivation for going and doing this wasn't just about the fact that she was somebody who was really fit and healthy herself. She'd really worked through her eating disorder and she was clearly at a very peak of fitness when she died. I think that she also was probably motivated because she could see the struggles that other people had and she would have used that and brought that to life within her work. She actually had a blog and her blog was all about her struggles and also was about how passionate she was about helping people who themselves struggled. She's absolutely gorgeous. She really was, she's a stunning girl, very intelligent, incredibly popular. So friends and family alike just said there was something about the way that she was when she walked into the room, like her smile would just light that room up. And Molly's friends actually described her as inspiring, as motivating, as a bright light. Her cousin described Molly as the happiest person that she had ever met. And everyone who met her warmed to her. She was the life and soul of the party. She was really active on social media, mostly because she was doing all this fitness and nutrition stuff. She was also working part-time as a barmaid, so she had a really full life. And I often think, particularly with people who've got mental health issues and eating disorders, 
that one of the things that they want to do is make everybody else always feel comfortable because they know how it feels to feel anxious and at times to feel lonely and at times to feel that they don't fit in because they kind of are synonymous with those mental health issues. And I think that Molly was one of those individuals from what I understand from reading about her and researching her who never wanted anybody else to struggle. So she went out of her way to be really kind to people that she met. If you met her on one occasion, you might be by yourself, she would be the kind of person who would immediately notice that you were by yourself and move towards you. And those kind of individuals, often there can be a lot of a burden associated with that as well, because clearly you are that concerned about everybody else's feelings because you're empathic. But also it means that when somebody does have the pleasure of your company and builds on that pleasure and builds on that relationship, that people like Molly are really loyal. And so I imagine that she, yes, wanted to make everybody feel special, wanted to make everybody feel safe. And absolutely, that would have caused her at times to be a bit overwhelmed and exhausted. But she was the type of individual who would push through that because what mattered to her were relationships and the relationships with those who were nearest and dearest had infinite meaning. So when I've looked at the relationships that she had with friends, they were those kind of relationships that we all crave. They were solid, they were genuine, they were authentic and they were full of love. And that, again, reflects who she was as a human being. In 2016, Molly sadly meets Joshua Stimson. He was two years older than her. So they matched with each other on Tinder. That was in July 2016. This is how people date these days. I am aware of that. But I always have this concern that people are very able to hide parts of their characters when it's on screens. Honestly, the 3D world is far better than the 2D world. And when you are building a relationship with somebody that you haven't yet met, it's a one-sided relationship. You build pictures and stories. It's not really about that other person at all. Yet yeah, you can communicate with them. Yes, you can think that you like them, but actually they aren't often the person that you're meeting in that space because they can disguise themselves effectively and because you're not physically present with them, you can't really take a gauge as to what they're presenting is actually authentically who they are. But nonetheless, this is how young people meet. Probably people of my age as well, but certainly how young people meet. Now, Joshua Stimson. So he lived in Waldham near Rochester in Kent. He'd actually grown up in Stoke-on-Trent. He was working at a warehouse. He was described by co-workers as being a Jekyll and Hyde character, basically. So he had two sides. So he would at times be very bright and very charming, but he'd also be somebody who could at times be a loner and who genuinely couldn't engage in conversation. He could also become distressed for no reason. Now, Molly and he both had a keen interest in the gym. So there was certainly a connector when it came down to their relationship. But as just noted there, that kind of character I've described, it could indicate mental health issues because if you've suffered from depression, you could absolutely be an individual who's bright and who's charming, but when you go through a really bad period, you don't even have the energy to speak to other people. So that could account for why he's a bit of a loner. And certainly it seems that when he was at school, he was actually treated as a young person for depression. So clearly there are some issues there. And think about Molly. She's somebody who's incredibly loving, incredibly giving, very compassionate and has an understanding personally of mental health. That's going to be a big connector as well. Because when you find people who share vulnerabilities with you, it's something that often builds bridges between you and makes you feel understood. And of course, in reflection, makes them also feel understood. So that could be a real allure as well. Now, the two meet in person in November 2016. So this is actually quite a long time after they'd matched online. So they matched three months earlier. So that's quite a period of time to grow a relationship that isn't actually based on anything but those conversations. So you've not physically had any interactions. And like I said, that means that you could have developed a lot of affection for that person based on something that isn't necessarily 100% true. Now, it doesn't take long after they meet physically that they start dating. And he was Molly's first real boyfriend. She'd never had a long-term boyfriend before. And that means that she hasn't got anything to compare him to. So if you think about the fact that, as his colleague said, he could be very charming at times, if that's who she met, 
if Stimson was somebody who is very charming, good looking, presented really well, was into the gym and discussed his vulnerabilities with her about his mental health issues. Well, initially, of course, she's going to be attracted to him. Why wouldn't you be? Now, according to people that knew Molly, they said that she felt quite sorry for Stimson. She felt that he was quite lonely and she genuinely felt that in the relationship, she'd be able to help him with his mental health. So they've connected over this shared struggle with anxiety. And then he even goes on to confide that he's had a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. I'm not aware whether he confided it was bipolar type one or bipolar type two, but arguably this is something that can be severely challenging for somebody who has to deal with this struggle on a day-to-day -day basis because bipolar, either type one or type two, type one being the more extreme, it's going to be quite debilitating at points. And when you're somebody who suffers from an eating disorder and you're seeing this other human being who to all intents and purposes on the surface looks great, seems fine, but beneath it apparently has these struggles, that's going to make you feel that you want to support them. And actually that makes you vulnerable. When you're a really empathic person and you care deeply about other people, you don't like to hurt them. And it means that if they give you enough examples of how they feel and the impact of those feelings and how terrible it is for them, that emotionally blackmails a lot of people to remain in situations that actually aren't that positive because they're thinking more about the other human being than their own needs. So it may be that Stimson actually uses this idea about him being vulnerable to hook Molly in and to make it difficult for her to leave him. And Molly's mum, understandably, is worried when Molly tells her that Stimson has bipolar disorder. And apparently Molly reacted quite negatively to this because as far as she was concerned, her mum was being judgmental. But actually, I completely understand. Listen, as a parent, you just want things to be easy for your kid. It's not because you're stigmatising mental health. It's not because you think that people who've got mental health issues are problematic. It's not because you don't believe that they deserve love. It's just, you think about your kid. You just think about, wouldn't it be nice if my child just had plain sailing? And the reality is, if you've got a child who's had a mental health issue that's been quite severe, such as bulimia, you also know that being around people who might have their own vulnerabilities can be triggering. And like I said, that is not for one second to stigmatise mental health in any way, shape or form. It's just a parental reaction that's absolutely normal. Of course, when mum gets to know him initially, she accepts him and she's lovely. Because, believe me, Molly's mother is a really lovely woman and she absolutely adores her daughter. I know that we all do. When we've got children, they are our world. But it's really important to express that because Molly's mum said that she was genuinely her best friend as far as she was concerned. They did everything together. They did retail therapy together. They were always conversing and they had an incredibly close relationship. And all Molly's mother wanted was for her to be happy. And I guess when Molly's talked about the fact that Stimson had bipolar, she was a little bit worried about how that might play out knowing her daughter's vulnerabilities. And what's really reprehensible is that it turns out at the trial, that Stimson didn't even have bipolar disorder. He just lied. It's as simple as that. He used it to manipulate Molly, and that's key. We're talking about a mindset and a character here where Stimson is concerned, who is so controlling, so manipulative, that he looked for ways to connect, and where there weren't connectors, he created them. And that's what he's doing there. He's saying, oh, you've had issues. Well, I've got issues too. Feel sorry for me and so on and so forth, which to anybody who is suffering from bipolar disorder will be absolutely frustrating and despicable because who lies about that kind of stuff? It's a really difficult situation at times to live with when you've got bipolar. Somebody wearing it as a false mask, it's disgusting. And it speaks to the kind of human being we're talking about where Joshua Stimson is concerned. So when Molly was actually having that conversation with her mum about the fact that he was bipolar and mum expressed that she wasn't necessarily that happy about it, Molly said, look, we can help each other. So even then, Molly was looking at their relationship 
as an opportunity to both be supportive to one another because they get each other, they understand each other. And one of Molly's friends, Amy, described it like this. She said they were partners in this dark place that could help each other see the light in the bad days. Unfortunately, where Stimson is concerned, I just think he is a dark place, full stop. And unfortunately, he's a dark place that's going to consume Molly. So at the beginning of the relationship, apparently the pair did seem to be quite happy with one another. But it doesn't seem to take very long before Joshua starts to get increasingly possessive over Molly. And that's a really problematic indicator. I understand that young people don't have the same amount of things going on in their world as you will do when you're 50. Because the responsibility level is enormous as you get older. You've got families, you've got mortgages, etc. And therefore, when you're younger, you can be more intense in relationships. And arguably, that's normal. But when somebody starts trying to tell you where you can go, who you can talk to, you need to get out. I mean it. It's as simple as that. That should be the rule of thumb. Anybody who believes that they can demand a behaviour from you to deny yourself the life that you had had prior to them, such as not being able to see the friends that you hang out with, not being able to go to certain places without that individual, it is time to cut them loose. But the problem is, when you're young, you haven't got that experience, you're not as stone cold stern as I've just described and often you'll give people second chances and third chances and fourth chances. Also, that sense of being told by someone, oh I want you with me or I don't want you to go there or I don't want you to speak to that person, I don't want you to flirt with them, that can sometimes feel as well as if they're really in love with you and they just want to keep you all for themselves and that can be quite alluring when you're young. You don't realise that that's actually a feature of things like coercive control and domestic abuse. Because again, you're young. So this would be confusing for Molly. Because she's obviously spent time getting to know him online. And then they've met. Things were working out. And then all of a sudden it starts to spiral. Molly's dad, Doug, who's lovely as well. Genuinely, when I've watched actual videos of the parents talking. And read certain things that have been written by them. It has really resounded with me just how incredibly close they all were. So Doug recalled how he seemed to want Molly all to himself. So Stimson was somebody that just wanted to possess her. He didn't like her seeing people. He didn't even like her hanging around with her family. And her friend Amy said that as far as she was concerned, all he wanted to do was completely isolate her from her friends. He didn't actually make friends of his own, it seems. He didn't have a big social network to any shape or degree. And it got really bizarre when Molly was revising for her exams because one of the things that Joshua did was he quit his job because he wanted to spend more time with her, which is absolutely ludicrous. And it speaks to a deep emotional immaturity along with a deep control issue because it's emotionally immature to go ahead and quit your job. Because, you know, you need money, just throwing it out there to do things like eat. But the fact is that he is now so fixated on her and so dominating within her life to some degree that he's willing to quit his job so that he can basically spend time with her. But we all know what we're talking about there is to up the ante regarding the control level he has in her life. And Molly is trying to revise her exam. She's an incredibly bright girl. So the last thing that she needs is her boyfriend turning up unannounced, interfering with her revision time, and basically just getting in the way. And I always find it really concerning when someone has got such poor control over their boundaries, because if you don't understand the etiquette of allowing somebody to revise, if you quit your job, even though you need one just to live, then it shows that you don't work and operate in the way that the vast majority of us do. You have to look at that behaviour and think that's really off, that's really odd. And it's quite possible, as far as I'm concerned, that the old brain isn't communicating effectively with certain areas because he should know that that's not appropriate. And the very fact that he's willing to act outside and operate outside those normal boundaries, that means that when you think about other behaviours, he's likely to act outside those boundaries in other ways too. And clearly, in this case, that's exactly what he does. And Molly's cousin actually said that Molly expressed that she felt suffocated. Now, understandably, because of this behaviour, they end up having some brief breakups. So whilst they're together, it's not always consistent. And the problem is whenever Molly says to Simpson it's over, he just refuses to accept it. 
Again, acting outside what we expect boundary wise. If somebody tells you it's over, okay, you might want to text them and say, really, can we not work on it? And sometimes you will obviously give that person another chance because people do have rows, people do break up. But refusing point blank to accept that somebody is breaking it off with you, again, it means they don't care about your feelings, they only care about their own. And we are talking about, where Stimson is concerned, a deep-seated and deep-rooted selfishness, without a doubt. There is something malevolent that runs within him and through him, and he really is not concerned about Molly, about her mental state, about what's going on for her. All he cares about are his needs. Molly's friend Amy said that he was somebody who would really do a very good job of manipulating Molly into taking him back. He'd even encouraged Molly to go to the doctors about her mental health. So he was basically trying to manipulate her into believing that the worries that she was having about him were all in her head. That's so Machiavellian. It's really narcissistic as well when you think about him feeling that he has a right to control her in any way, shape or form, even if that means manipulating her to believe that she's potentially going a little bit crazy and that she needs to seek help because he's doing absolutely nothing wrong. And Molly, we know, has already had vulnerabilities on a mental health level, so destabilising her this way is just deeply unfair. Molly's mum actually said that at times it was just easier for her to take him back because his behaviour was just so awful and abnormal when she did actually break up with him. There was an occasion at Molly's aunt's 60th birthday party and it's at this point Molly's family realised that there's something not right about Stimson. So Molly's mum, Joanna, said that he'd been staring at Molly when she was having fun and she could see that the way he was looking at her was basically to say, come and sit back down, I don't want you dancing. And obviously Molly was enjoying herself. So Stimson didn't join in the party at all. In fact, he was just concentrating his focus on her, obviously furious that Molly was actually enjoying herself and was paying attention to other people aside from him. Now, after the party had ended, Molly's mum actually got a concerning message because they were at a hotel and Molly was with Stimson in the hotel room. So this text message is asking Molly's mum to go to the hotel room because Stimson's kicking off. When mum arrives at the hotel room, they are indeed having an altercation, but this is because Stimson has decided that he's going to record Molly because he wants to get leverage against her. And that, again, is a really coercive method. It's why you can't look at recorded information when somebody has knowingly done that without the other person being aware, because they will present themselves as being very placid, very patient, very nice, whilst the other person is probably losing their mind at the time because they're in some kind of row and they're not aware that they're being videoed. And people will use that and say, oh, well, look how calm and patient I was and look at how crazy this person seemed to be. And it is deeply upsetting. And it's also quite humiliating when people do that to you, when they video you in that way, because you were both in the altercation. It's just one has manipulated that altercation for a purpose that is clearly sinister. And in this case, that's exactly what it is. Stimson is doing this because he wants to humiliate her and have evidence of that. So potentially, if she betrays him as far as he is concerned or leaves him, well, he'll have things to use against her. Now, when Amun Joanna came in and saw this, Joshua Stimson actually tried to get her to listen to the recordings of Molly. And Joanna actually said that she knew instantly that something wasn't right in that scenario, that it was really odd he was asking her to get her to listen to her daughter who'd been videoed by him. And she said that that was the first time I thought something isn't quite right. And it really isn't, because like I said, that's a classic coercive control method. Her friends described Joshua as being the kind of person that only ever wanted Molly's attention on him. And if she dared to divert attention elsewhere, there was a problem. Now, even though there are clear cracks in this relationship and Molly is not feeling happy within it, they had a holiday booked in May 2017 because it had been pre-booked. Molly decided that she was going to go, she was going to see how it was when she was there, and then she would see how she felt when she actually returned. But it was awful. And while she was on holiday, she clearly wasn't having a good time at all. She's messaging friends about the fact she's having an anxiety attack. She was really worried about upsetting Josh, so she must have felt like she was treading on eggshells. 
And it's during this period of time, she realized that she just needed to break up with Joshua. She didn't feel the same way about him. And she actually, on a return from the holiday, told her mum that she had no feelings for Stimson at all anymore. And the problem she really was facing was that Molly didn't know how to actually effectively break up with him because she knew that he was going to be difficult and she was concerned with how he would feel as well. So even though he had done quite a lot of awful things to her, and even though she wasn't feeling happy in the relationship, that sense of being empathic was really clouding her judgment to some degree because she didn't want to upset him, she didn't want to hurt him. And that's, again, evidence of who Molly was. She was always putting everyone else before herself. Molly finally gets the strength to break up with Stimson for good after their seven-month relationship on the 17th of June, 2017. And apparently she felt really relieved. She just felt that a weight had been lifted. But as we expected from what we've seen previously regarding Stimson, he refuses to accept this. So now he's just bombarding Molly with messages. But this time it's for real for her. It doesn't matter that he's manipulated her before and that she's taken him back before. It doesn't matter how hard he is pushing. She realises she doesn't want him in her life. And so she will not get back with him. This is it. It is over. And of course, he is incensed by that because he has wanted to control her from the get-go and now he has literally no control. And now she's free to go and do and be and share her time with whoever she wishes to. And that is something that is deeply infuriating for him. So now he's going to up the ante and his behaviour gets more and more concerning. So he's harassing Molly online and he was doing really nasty stuff. So he's posting things on Facebook that are really derogatory. And bear in mind, even though she'd blocked him on a lot of social media fronts, he was friends with people that she was friends with. And that meant that people that she knew would see information that was really nasty about her. So he's putting derogatory messages on Facebook, really awful photos. He's posting messages that said that she'd been taking drugs. Cocaine was what he was mentioning. And he's tagging people in these posts so that Molly's family would see. And she was devastated by this. One, she's got a health and fitness blog and she's somebody who's really invested in being seen as a healthy human being. And somebody suggesting he's taking class A's isn't going to promote that. And it's the powerlessness and the violation that you feel when somebody is actively going out of their way to troll you. And when it's somebody that you are actually in a relationship with that you cared for, it's even more upsetting because, yes, it's past the point of no return. There's no way you'd ever want to be back with them. But they're going to have information about you that you don't want other people to have. At the end of the day, when you're in a relationship with somebody, you share things that you wouldn't share with others because you have an intimate connection. You do things with them that you wouldn't want other people to know because it's an intimate relationship. When a person uses that level of trust that once was against you, it makes you feel really violated and deeply vulnerable. He just wants to humiliate her. He wants to ruin her image. And again, that's coercive, isn't it? That's a way of making you behave in a certain way towards them or there'll be consequences. And ultimately, we're seeing his true self walking forward at this moment in time. Her friend Amelia said that Molly was literally distraught. And you would be. Now, following these posts, Molly and her mum actually reported them to Facebook. Now, Facebook did initially take the initial post down, but Stimson then just posted again. And then Facebook said that they couldn't do anything as Joshua Stimson hadn't, as far as they were concerned, done anything wrong, which seems deeply and grossly unfair. I appreciate that in the world we have freedom of expression to some degree, and I'm a massive believer in free speech, but I really don't like things that are hateful because I genuinely believe that's harassment. And often you will see people writing the most horrific things and for some reason it doesn't violate the terms and conditions when it comes down to social media. And I don't get it because it's defamatory, it's libelous at times. And in this case, it's absolutely harrowing for Molly because he is literally sharing personal information, fabricating information, and putting her in a position where she's probably feeling that she has to apologise to the people that she loves when she's done absolutely nothing wrong. 
Stimson's messages continue. He's constantly bombarding her with them. And she was really scared that he'd just turn up at her house. So she starts talking to her friends about how terrified she is of Stimson. She's sending messages to them saying things like, I'm scared he might hurt me. He knows my parents are going away for two weeks. So she understands that he has potential. She really does. She's got a grasp of this man. She connects that there is something very dark within his nature. And she clearly believes that he could do her great harm. Molly and her mum, Joanna, they end up going to North Kent Police Station because she is so concerned and because he's posting all of this information. Now, at the police station, the officer that they speak to makes a call to Joshua Stimson and warns him, basically, that if he doesn't stop, he's going to face prosecution. Now, during the call, when Molly and her mother are listening to this, it's on speaker so that she, they can hear the actual responses from Stimson as well. In response to him being asked, we wouldn't want Molly to come to the police station again about you, would we? Joshua responded, wouldn't we? Now that is horrifying. You're talking about a police officer calling you because you are doing something that has warranted that phone call. Most of us would be horrified that an officer of the law was on the phone basically telling us off and we'd apologise, we'd accept it, we'd agree that we're not going to do it again. But to say, wouldn't we? It means that, again, those boundaries don't exist. He's not concerned about authority. He's certainly not concerned about being told what to do where Molly is concerned. And it's threatening. It's saying, well, maybe I would. Maybe you wouldn't want me to. Maybe I would want to do this. Maybe I would want to continue. And he even started to repeat on that phone call that he hadn't done anything wrong. And they also said that he wrote on social media that there was more to come. And that is dark because it shows intent and it shows a festering of that intent. Molly's mom actually described Stimson on that call that she listened to as really cool, calm and collected and also cold. So I guess we could say detached, but that's not what you would be like if you were a normal, typical human being and the police were on the phone telling you to stop harassing your ex-girlfriend. And Molly mirrored her mother's feelings, so she actually spoke to one of her friends and said that he was just so cold and it had really frightened her a lot. And it's at this point the police tell Molly and her friends and family to actually block Stimson and also to report any other abuse. The police then have to speak to him again on the 27th of June 2013 because he's still not leaving Molly alone. And that's really worrying because it means that they have no power. If somebody is refusing to act in accordance with what the police are guiding them to do as regards the harassment and stalking of an individual, if they blindly press on with that behaviour, it's because they have no respect for the authorities and the fixation they have on their victim is worth more to them than their potential freedom in the future. That means that their consequential thinking is limited and impaired because of the way that they feel about that person. So ultimately, it directs us to understand immediately that Molly is in danger. And what's really scary is that even though Molly and her mum don't know this, Joshua Stimson has previously had his behaviour reported to the police. But of course, what do we say? Missed opportunities? Because the police failed to make any connections at the time of the report. So Molly and her mother are now very concerned about Joshua Stimson's behaviour to such a degree that they actually circulate photos of him to the neighbours so that the neighbours can keep an eye out for him. And they're not doing that because he's just an annoyance. They're not doing that because he's just frustrating and, you know, he might turn up and cry. They're doing it because they think that he's potentially dangerous, without a doubt. And it's awful to think that they genuinely had to be in a situation where they were taking the law into their own hands to some degree by protecting Molly this way because the framework of protection around her that should have been there simply didn't exist because the authorities weren't taking action that really, I believe, should have happened. So despite the fact that Molly and all her friends and family have blocked Stimson on social media, it doesn't stop him stalking her because... He'd managed to recruit a girl 
to actually follow Molly on her social media and to report back her every single move. And allegedly, this girl offered. That in itself is disturbing. I couldn't find the information on the girl. I couldn't find her name, etc. I have looked, but it's despicable behaviour. I appreciate that what people will say is, well, he's a very corrosive human being. He's a very coercive human being. He's one of those individuals who wears masks. He's a manipulator and so on and so forth. And therefore, particularly if this girl is younger and less schooled in the world, he may well have been able to present himself as a victim and to tell her a story and a web of lies. That means that she feels sorry for him. And therefore, she will feed back this information, believing that she's helping the victim. But it's just sinister to agree to do that because you are engaging in stalking behaviour yourself. And you have to ask yourself at every point, what kind of a human being wants you to do that for them? It just doesn't make any sense that there is any positive intention for an individual who wants you to literally stalk their ex and report back on every single one of their movements, but that's what she does, she goes ahead and does that. So 11 days after Molly and Joshua Stimpson split up, this is on the 28th of June, he turns up at a bar that Molly's at. Now, it turns out she had posted on social media that she was going out, but as far as she was concerned, she thought that Stimpson wouldn't see that because he was blocked. But there he is, at the Ship and Trades pub in Dockside, Chatham. He turns up with another girl, I would imagine that's the girl, who's feeding back all this information. And immediately, Molly and her friends are on the back foot. They're worried about how he's turned up there. And they're struggling to understand whether it was something by design or just by chance. And the fact that he's with a girl, well, arguably, she's a great cover, isn't she? Because now it's going to confuse both Molly and her friends. Well, maybe he is just coming out on a date, for example, and it just happens to be that we've arrived at the same place unbeknownst to the group, he's been completely aware of where they were going to be, and that's why he's turned up. He is actively stalking Molly. And maybe he was trying to make her jealous, but he just stood all night staring at Molly from the smoking area. And Molly's friends described him as coming out and across like a psycho and a creep that night. Molly did try to go on the side of positivity and believe it was coincidence, but it did lead to her actually going home earlier because she just felt really uncomfortable by his presence because one, he didn't smoke. So he was over in the smoking area because they were in that area. So it was clearly down to him wanting to be near her and make her be aware that he was present. And anybody who has the confidence to turn up at a place where you and your friends are, even though you have split up with them and to stand staring at you to let you know I am present, I am here. There is nothing you can do. Wherever you are, I might be. That's a deep message that impacts on every level, vulnerability-wise, because you're always looking over your shoulder. That's the issue psychologically with stalking. You're always fearing that that person, that individual, might be behind you. And you're always thinking about what next, what might happen tomorrow what might happen next week. You're second guessing everything because you don't understand the motives, motivations and potential of that person, but you do know that their behavior is so weird and so distinct from your own that you can't feel safe. That's why stalking literally disintegrates the lives of their victims. And it's why when you've been a victim of stalking, the world always feels a far more vulnerable place, forever, because you're aware there are these kind of people who genuinely can fixate on you to such a degree that no matter where you are, they will only be a few steps behind you. And even when those people are dealt with by the courts, it doesn't always prove effective. There is something about their fixation with you that is so deep, that is so dark, that that malevolent devotion of the darkest level is something that means that no law will stand in their way, no court will stand in their way, and no prison at times will stand in their way. They'll return to it afterwards. So Molly is obviously aware that she's potentially in danger, 
but she's probably hoping to God that that girl is potentially in your love interest in Stimson's world. She starts to talk to her friends. She actually texted one and said, I'm scared he might hurt me. I don't know how on edge he is. She said he's turned really nasty. He's literally lost the plot and she was right. But I don't think he'd lost the plot in the context of being someone who is hysterical, someone who is completely out of control. I think what Stimson is, more than anything, is absolutely in control. Joshua Stimson had been told by police on two occasions to stay away from Molly, but he never listened. He didn't care because all he was concerned about was the anger and rage he felt towards Molly. All he had was that sense of losing control over the woman that he wanted to dominate and he wasn't willing to have it. So on the 29th of June, 2017, Molly had just gone to the gym. She's working out and while she's at the gym, she spots that Joshua is basically exercising next to her. Now this is just 12 days after they've broken up. And once she spots him and the fact that there's almost an empty gym and yet for some reason he's coming exercise next to her, she starts messaging her friends because she's scared. So she sent messages on WhatsApp. She actually sent a picture of Joshua and she wrote, feel like I'm fucking looking over my shoulder all the time. During that period in the gym, she exchanges 20 messages with a friend about Joshua's behavior. She even messages a mum and says, mummy's turned up at the gym and come next to me. Then she calls the mum and her mum says, just come straight home. Even though she didn't potentially want to have any exchange with Joshua Stimson at this moment in time, I think that she probably felt compelled to just surface the reality that it's odd that he's come and exercised next to her considering they've broken up. So she actually says to him, are you following me? She asks, why aren't you at work? And he said, it's none of her business. So Josh then leaves, and I imagine that ultimately she'd have felt incredibly relieved at that moment in time. But what she doesn't know is even though he's left the gym, he hasn't really left the area. In fact, he gets into his car and he just slowly drives around the car park. Molly then waits a little bit of time before leaving the gym herself and then she goes to her car which is in a shopping centre car park for Chatham Dockside Outlet in Kent. This is just after 11am. But what Molly hadn't realised was that Joshua Stimson hadn't gone home, hadn't gone anywhere. In fact he'd just been waiting for her and he follows her to her car. Then he abandons his own vehicle, forces open the door to Molly's car and that's when the frenzied brutal attack begins that's when he starts to attack her with a knife. Molly is obviously in absolute shock and terror. And Molly is a warrior. She is desperately attempting to fight back. She's screaming, she's beeping her horn, but the attack was just so brutal that she died within minutes. Molly was stabbed 75 times. And bear in mind that she would have been dead after the first 30. So the other 45, that was just because he wanted to absolutely execute her and destroy her body. That wasn't just a message about killing her. That was a message to people who loved her that they would endure the agony of knowing how brutally slayed she was. She had stab wounds to her head, to her chest, to her throat. There were catastrophic injuries. Now, whilst the attack was going on, a passerby actually attempted to help Molly. I mean, he was an absolute hero, a guy called Benjamin Morton, and he tries to pull Stimson out of the car, but it was really difficult because he couldn't get hold of him because his legs were just coated in blood, and that was making him slippy. They also tried to slam the door on him, but he just carried on with the relentless attack. Stimson had made the decision, and nothing was going to come between him and the death of Molly. He wanted to murder her, he wanted to execute her, and... The fact that that passerby put himself in danger because somebody like Stimson, he'd already gone ahead and attacked her in a way that meant that she was going to lose her life. So really killing another person probably wouldn't have caused him that much of an issue. So Benjamin could have been murdered himself. But again, the fact that he doesn't do that suggests that the fixation in that moment is to literally destroy Molly. He just wants to be there to be able to time and time again brutalize her body because she dared to leave him the police the paramedics and a doctor arrive literally within minutes and they do attempt to save molly but her injuries are so catastrophic there wasn't a hope 
she was pronounced dead at the scene of the crime at 11.43 a.m. At that point, Joshua was arrested by the police at the scene of the murder. After Molly was clearly dead, Joshua Stimson basically just walked up and down pacing until the police arrived. He didn't make any attempt to flee, he just waited for the police. And when they arrived, he said, she's in the car, I've killed her. And he appeared really calm, really unaffected by what he'd done. And bear in mind, this guy was literally covered in blood. His hands were covered in blood. He had injuries to his hands because whilst he'd been harming her, he'd also hurt himself because he slipped on the knife. And the knife itself that was used to kill Molly was on the driver's seat where she was killed. So they were able to get the implement that murdered her, so to speak. But he was cool, calm and collected. Just think about what I've described. It's absolutely torturous harrowing, devastating, and this guy is just cool as a cucumber. Now, because of the extremely public nature of the attack, the news of Molly's murder actually gets spread through social media really quickly, and this means that Molly's family and friends sadly learnt about her murder online before they could even be informed by the police. And it's just devastating because Molly's dad was working abroad at the time on a ship, and that meant that her mother, Joanna, had to call him to deliver the news. She said he was so far away and he had to cope with that, with no one around him. It was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. Cannot even begin to comprehend how she must have felt. First of all, the fact that her daughter's murder is just online everywhere before she's even had an opportunity to come to terms with the reality of what's played out. And then she has to tell her husband that their absolutely adored child, he's never gonna actually get to hold her again. He's never gonna get to speak to her again. It's just torturous to imagine that. When it came down to Stimson's trial, it happened at Maidstone Crown Court. It started 23rd of January, 2018, and the public gallery was packed. Molly was loved. She was incredibly popular. She was adored by people who knew her and her life had touched so many people and in fact her death of course had touched so many people molly's mom said that joshua stimson looked emotionless throughout and also he refused to make any eye contact but why would a coward make eye contact at the end of the day that's what he is he's a coward during the trial the court heard how joshua stimson had carefully considered when to execute molly he planned it he purchased a kitchen knife and a pickaxe two days before he actually carried out the attack and Joshua was seen on CCTV in Asda buying the knife and also in home base buying the pickaxe. The prosecutor described Joshua as a cold calculated and determined killer and that was something that without a doubt played out in reality he genuinely was those things and Joshua had previously had his behaviour reported to the police and it is pretty harrowing when you listen to what he'd actually done because during the trial two ex-girlfriends told the court how Joshua had stalked them after they'd split up so let's go through some of these things because it is pretty horrifying so Alexandra Dale she had a relationship with Joshua Stimson in summer of 2013 and she said that when they met in Newcastle under Lyme they met on Tinder they met at the local pub and then they'd gone into town to the Revolution Bar where Stimson had told her not to talk to any men because he didn't like it. So when the night was over, Alexandra apparently received around 25 missed calls from Stimson. And then she went on to describe how he'd send her pictures of herself, asking why she was wearing certain clothes. But she said that she wasn't actually with him when he took the photographs, so clearly he was stalking her. And the abuse culminated in Stimson sending a message to Alexandra while she was on holiday saying, I'm going to fly out and drown you. Horrifying. He also told her ex-boyfriend that she'd slept with his brother, sent her a picture of a back garden despite having never been told where she lived and slashed all the tyres on her car after telling her there's a surprise waiting for you when you get home. I mean, that's is terrifying. Then Leah Hubbard, she actually spoke to the court about the relationship that she also had with Stimson. She'd met him in a bar in May 2016. They had quite a brief relationship, 
but initially they'd met several times after they'd first connected, the week after the first encounter, essentially they'd met quite a lot. But then she had to go to a Hindu that was going to be happening on the Friday. And immediately he was concerned about that. And he said that he didn't want her to speak to any other boys. And on top of that, she ends up saying that she has to go and visit a nan for a birthday, which would have been on the Sunday after that Friday. And he just repeatedly attempted to call her, to text her via WhatsApp. And she just knew there was something wrong with him and it just wasn't going to work because he was so intense. So Leah said that she actually ended the relationship just a week later, but said that in spite of the fact that this was a really early fledgling relationship, they hadn't had an intensity, they hadn't spent a long time together. In spite of this, he ends up turning up at her flat 2am when she'd been asleep, saying that he'd been abandoned by his friends in town and needed to charge his phone. So then she described how she'd stayed up with him, but then she'd asked him to leave when his phone was charged, but then he just burst into tears, so she ended up letting him stay. Now, the following day, she actually said to him, if you ever come back to my flat, I'm going to call the police. But in spite of giving him those boundaries, on a night out at the Source Bar, she described how he always seemed to be in the same room as her, and he always seemed to be watching her. And then on another occasion, he actually spat a drink at her. And even though he was thrown out at that point, he waited outside for her for hours. So this behavior has escalated. And the problem is because there was no intervention, because this man had not had consequences, it feels like he upped the ante. He became more confident. He became more willing to push those boundaries because he got away with it before. Now, the witness, Benjamin Morton, who obviously was the hero who tried to stop the horrific attack, on Molly. He said it was like a frenzy when he saw the murder play out. He said that Molly was just slashed again and again. Now, when it came down to Joshua Stimson in court, he basically admitted manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility, but he denied murder. Of course he did, because he wants to try and get a lower sentence. Simple as that. Now he's executed this poor, beautiful girl. It's all about that selfishness playing through him seeming to be less responsible and accountable because, of course, I didn't actually know what I was doing. Well, you did, because you went and bought the knife, the murder weapon, a couple of days before. Because you went to the gym that she was at. Because you drove around the car park and waited till she came out so you could follow her, so you could kill her. That is premeditation, full stop. Simple as that. But he said he was suffering from bipolar disorder and uses that as a reference and a leverage. And of course, that's really upsetting for anybody with bipolar. Bipolar disorder does not make you want to murder people at all. You might be slightly more at risk of harming yourself, but you're not gonna kill anybody else because you're bipolar. His defense team said that Joshua was basically suffering from an emotionally unstable personality disorder, so EUPD, and that he had a hypersensitivity to rejection. Joshua Stimson also argued that it was the fact that his mother left the family when he was a teenager and that this led to a pathological fear of abandonment. I'm sorry, a pathological fear of abandonment doesn't make you kill the person that you want to be with. You're desperate to get them back. You don't want to end their lives so no one else can have them. That isn't how it works. A pathological fear of abandonment due to attachment issues is going to make you, yes, desperate to remain and retain relationships and feel absolutely burdened and broken when they break down because you're so desperate to have that connection. It doesn't make you want to execute somebody in cold blood. Again, he's using his highly manipulative personality there. He's basically trying to play a game where he seems like a victim. But the only victim in this case is Molly and of course his previous victims that he stalked. So this is his argument. That fear caused him to lose his self-control after the breakup and led to him killing Molly. And he conveniently said that he didn't remember anything of the attack. But fortunately, the psychiatrist for the prosecution was like, I don't even need to have an interview with you because clearly you are a cold blooded killer. But apparently it's not okay to just do that. You do actually have to assess them. So the psychiatrist assessed him and said that Joshua Stimson carried out the premeditated attack absolutely in control. He knew what he was doing, that it was premeditated, he was focused, and he was in control. 
The psychiatrist also said that Stimson was not suffering from bipolar disorder and didn't meet the threshold for a personality disorder. So basically, he was just bullshitting. There wasn't anything psychiatrically notable regarding any disorder that could contribute to him doing what he did, aside from being somebody who's sane but deeply psychopathic, I would imagine. So it was found that he didn't have a medical defence to reduce his sentence to manslaughter, which is a good thing because that is not manslaughter. Anyone can look into that kind of killing and immediately tell that that is not manslaughter. It is exceedingly wicked, it is exceedingly cruel, and it was without doubt highly premeditated. His trial took two weeks, but it only took the jury four hours to deliberate, and in February 2018, Joshua Stimson was found guilty of murder. Amen. Because that's all it could ever have been. Murder, pure and simple. Whilst his verdict was read out, unsurprisingly, Joshua Stimson showed no emotion because at the end of the day, he doesn't feel like you or I would. Molly's family broke down into tears and there were shouts of yes. In the judge's summing up, she said this, this was a cruel, calculated and cowardly act. This was an act of wickedness. You took away Molly's life quite deliberately in the most vicious fashion. You were determined to punish her for ending the relationship with you. You were seeking revenge. Her family's grief and anguish is raw and apparent for everyone to see. She also said that as far as she was concerned, he had shown absolutely no remorse for killing Molly. She added this, I am sure you are not suffering from a personality disorder. You plan this killing. You are a highly dangerous young man and you will pose a very considerable risk to women for a very considerable period in the future. When it came to the sentencing of Joshua Stimson, he got life in prison with a minimum term of 26 years. And as Stimson was led to the cells, one of Molly's relatives shouted, go on, you bastard. And genuinely, I would think that the rest of the court should have given them a round of applause because genuinely, no woman is safe when men like this are walking the streets. The judge also added when the sentence was passed that he may never be released that he may serve more than the minimum term and that that would be a matter for the parole board. So even though he's got 26 years that he's minimally got to serve, so he's got to do all of those years, it could be that he never actually gets released. And when it comes to people like Joshua Stimson, I think they will always pose a risk full stop. Molly's family said that Joshua's verdict did offer them a small measure of comfort, but as far as they were concerned, they were serving a lifetime of pain anguish and loss. Molly's family actually put a statement out after he'd been sentenced and it read like this. The last six months have been horrid beyond belief. We couldn't have got through it without the love and support of the family and friends. The number of Molly's friends have staggered us, the like of which we have never known. Those that have visited and shared in our pain have been a great help. We would like to thank Kent Police for their diligence collecting and collating the evidence. We would also like to thank the prosecution team for expediting the due process of the law. The full extent of the digital stalking of Molly by Joshua Stimson may never be known. We would like to thank Benjamin Morton for his brave efforts at the car park where he tried to intervene and hope one day to thank him personally. The contrast in morality between these two people could not be more profound. However, in light of this case, we feel there needs to be more awareness over the dangers of stalking and the need for people to report any concerns over stalking to the police. The verdict has brought us a small measure of comfort, but it seems that nothing will take away the pain or allow us to come to terms with our Molly being taken from us. We are serving a lifetime of pain, anguish and loss. This has affected so many lives and our hearts go out to each and every one of you. Our focus now turns to making sure Molly will live on through the Molly McLaren Foundation, helping people with eating disorders. Thank you all for your ongoing support with this. A light has gone out in all of our hearts, but shines bright as a star forever glowing. We love you, Molly. Molly's parents have called for changes in the police system due to the failures in this case. They've called for a greater liaison between police forces because if when Joanne and Molly had gone to Kent Police, they could have tracked down the other alleged crime in Staffordshire, it may have thrown a whole new light onto things 
and it may have raised more alarms and arguably that means that Molly potentially could still be alive. The Kent police actually did report themselves to the Independent Police Complaints Commission because they felt that there were failings in the case and they said that the inquiry would be finalised after the criminal proceedings have been concluded. Because of these investigations, Staffordshire Police have now changed their policy on reports of stalking and that means that officers are now required to record stalking as a crime even if the victims don't want to take matters further. So even if the person withdraws the complaint, it will still be recorded. And the whole premise of that is that they want to prevent tragedies like this from ever occurring again. And my God, these tragedies do not need to happen again. It's as simple as that, because if we take these things more seriously, then the lessons will be learned and people will be protected as opposed to failed. Molly is obviously horrifically missed by her family and friends. She was described by her mum as the light of their lives and like I said there is something captivating beautiful incredibly kind and compassionate about Molly and the fact that her life has been ended so horribly is something that must be intolerable for each member of the family to bear and for those friends who were lucky enough to have the light within their lives illuminated by such a presence as Molly. Following Molly's death the Molly McLaren Foundation donation page was set up and it had raised over £100,000 for charity and the charity distributed the money that it raised to groups that support people with eating disorders. Also, it raised awareness of eating disorders and the work that charities are doing. And the statement on their Just Giving page read, For those of you who were close to Molly, you'll know that she battled with bulimia and subsequently anxiety as a result of an eating disorder for many years of her life. Instead of letting this beat her, she shared her own story in the hopes of empowering others around her. We want to create a legacy in her honour by channeling her passion and drive to create the most positive outcome possible through the creation of the Molly McLaren Foundation. Sadly, after five years, the foundation announced in April 2023 that it was closing, but that's five years of work and five years of changing lives in Molly McLaren's name. And that is a legacy. I think that her family are incredible to take such a horrific event and to try to have a positive impact on other people's worlds it just speaks for their compassion and it doesn't surprise me that Molly McLaren was such a guiding light and was such a wonderful human being because clearly she was brought up in a family that surrounded her in love and wrapped her and cradled her in their love and it's something that brought out the best qualities in a young girl who undoubtedly would have made an impact in this world. And whenever we cover cases like this, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the loss of a human being that could have created light in this world. And that means that the world shines a little less brightly because of their loss. I'm sure that you all feel as equally frustrated as I do that Molly McLaren lost her life in the way that she did. I think there were missed opportunities. I think the family did everything in their power. I think Molly did everything in her power. They did everything right. They reported the stalking. They blocked him on social media. They told the police when his behaviour was escalating. They could not have done more. They even got in touch with neighbours, putting his picture out there so that the neighbours could tell them if he was around the area. They did their best and still Molly lost a life. The reality is that people like Stimson need to be placed in situations and conditions where they cannot act this way. And maybe if the stalking had been taken more seriously, as it was taken seriously by Molly and her family, we wouldn't even be talking about this case today and Molly would be living her life as she deserves to do. As ever guys, let me know your thoughts. I imagine you are all as frustrated as I am where this case is concerned. And it boils down to one particular theme, doesn't it? A man thinking, if I can't have you, then no one can have you. That's the motivation. That's the entitlement. How grotesque, how reprehensible, how inhumane is Stimson. And let's hope that the judge is correct and that the parole board never believe that he's ever going to be safe to walk our streets again. Take care guys, be safe.